Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about molecular orbital theory and polyatomics. Last time we were talking about valence bond theory and polyatomics and using hybridization to explain some molecular structures. But now we're going to move on to molecular orbital theory for polyatomics. We've covered molecular orbital theory for diatomics in the past, but we need to do this for polyatomics. And so molecular orbital theory right, is truly quantum mechanical because it doesn't assign, you know, some electrons to be hybridized with others or core electrons or totally non-bonding lone pairs like Lewis dot or some of these other. It just takes all the electrons in a molecule and all their wave functions, moves the nuclei around, and solves Schrodinger equations to determine the position of the nuclei that gives the lowest energy and the molecular orbitals associated with that. And so in MO theory, we're just looking at pictures of these molecular orbitals that come out of solutions of Schrodinger's equation and seeing how they're delocalized and how they're ordered. Okay, so molecular orbital theory for polyatomics. We're just going to use a test case today and look at one of the simplest polyatomics, water and its related species. Okay, so we'll call it maybe H2A here. Okay, where A is going to be anything from beryllium, maybe, uh, to oxygen. So if we think about, on one hand, H2 beryllium, the bond angle here is 180 degrees. But in H2O, as we talked about in the beginning of last lecture, the bond angle is 104.5 degrees. Now, molecular orbital theory is going to say, all right, what are the solutions to Schrodinger equation? What are the molecular orbitals? But how many electrons are occupying those molecular orbitals? So how many molecular orbitals are actually in play in determining the energy? And we're going to assume here that our molecular orbital energies in total is proportional to the total energy of the molecule. Right? So Quantum theory says that, you know, the structure for any molecule is not like valence shell electron pair theory or Lewis structure theory or even hybridized orbitals. It's just where do the nuclei have to be to minimize the total energy? And we're going to assume here that the total energy, not strictly true, but we're going to assume it's maybe not equal but proportional to the electronic energy. And remember, this is really what the molecular orbitals are. Right, they're the wave functions that when you solve the Hamiltonian of just the electronic part, right, the Hamiltonian for the electronic terms, not the nuclear terms, what you, do you fall out? The electronic energy times the wave functions, and these wave functions are the molecular orbitals. So if you sh solve this for the molecular orbitals, see which ones are occupied, add up their energies, that is the electronic energy. And maybe the total energy of the molecule is very proportional to that electronic energy. It's not equal because you have other things like electron-electron uh, correlation and repulsion, as well as nuclear energies that come into play, as well as rotational and vibrational energies. But if it's proportional, then it means the minimum total energy and the structure that goes with that, the one that's going to be adopted, is about the minimum molecular orbital energies. And so the electrons are only going to fill the lowest molecular orbitals. And that might explain the structure of the molecule, as we'll see. Okay, so for these, because there's a lot of drawings here, I'm actually going to use some figures. I'm not going to draw all this by hand, although I will annotate some things. And here's molecular orbital theory, right? You can kind of guess for water and its molecular orbital theory. Remember, before we were just doing diatomics like H2 or N2 or helium-2 which isn't stable. But now we have polyatomics H2O. And we can sort of guess the shapes of the molecular orbitals because we've talked about linearly combining atomic orbitals. They might look like this. They might look like this, like this, or like this. All right, so this bottom one here is the 2s orbital on oxygen, atomic orbital, overlapping with the 2s's on hydrogen. It is going to be lower in energy usually for the bonding because this 2s energy is much lower. 
Okay, so the lowest energy one looks like this because that's the molecular orbital built out of oxygen's s orbital right here, overlapping with this bonding character s orbital here. Okay, the next lowest one is going to come from a 2p orbital overlapping with an s orbital that's antibonding. And this is because, just think of the overlap, if the 2p orbital is here, this is one sign, this is the other, this is now creating quite a bit of favorable overlap here and here and here and here. So that's beneficial, remember, electron atomic orbital overlap creates low molecular orbital energies. The more overlap, the better, right? You're basically adding delocalization, lengthening the box, so it's a lower energy for the particle in a box model. The next molecular orbital up is going to be created out of this 2pz orbital, overlapping with this bonding s orbitals from hydrogen. Okay, so if I take this 2pz, which looks like this, nope, looks like this, and this is the shaded part, well, now I have decent overlap here. It's not as good as the overlap here. Why? Because there's an overlap there and there, right? So I get twice the benefit here because there's two overlaps. All of the p orbital is being overlapped with some s character. And so that's why this one is the lowest in energy. The next highest in energy is this one that we're drawing right here. The next highest in energy is going to be similarly Well, let's see. Oh, th this is, yeah, sorry. This is this one here. I thought it was being redundant. Uh, the next highest energy after that is this one. And it's exactly the energy of the 2px orbital, right? So this lowest one is 2s. It's lowest energy because this is the lowest. The next one up is this one because you're getting twice the overlap here. The next one up is this one because there's still good overlap. But the next one up is the 2px orbital. And the reason here is because this is into and out of the plane. So if this is maybe two positive s atomic, or at s atomic orbitals, any overlap sort of coming out of the screen with this is negated by the overlap behind the screen with this. Okay, so there's actually a non-bonding orbital. There is no net overlap here because of symmetry. For the same reason we talked about earlier, if you want to look at a side view here of an S, overlapping with a P. Remember, a P has negative and positive. So as I move these two things together, there's going to be, yes, good overlap here, but it's going to be exactly destroyed by any overlap here. So there's going to be destructive interference as I move this S orbital towards the P orbital destructive interference that ruins the constructive interference, okay? What all that means is that there is no net overlap. The energy of this doesn't change. So it is just whatever the 2px orbital is, okay? So this is the molecular orbital diagram for any of these H2A systems. It's just that here it's for water and here we're drawing the electrons. Now, when I change the angle, how does each of these change? Right? As I change the angle to 180 degrees, okay, this overlap actually gets a little less favorable. right? Because down here you at least have some overlap of these two. But as you flatten this out, there's no more overlap of this guy and this guy. So it becomes a little less stable as you increase the angle. This one becomes more stable. And it becomes much more stable more quickly than one destabilizes. So as I bring this up and this up, flattening out the angle of the molecule, 
you get a lot more overlap. So this really gets stabilized as it goes to 180. This becomes much less stabilized because now you're approaching that sort of non-bonding character. And this one's not affected at all because it's always non-bonding. So graphically, that looks like this. Okay, there's a little bit of a formatting issue here, but this should be over here. Okay, and this is now a diagram that shows how the molecular orbitals change in energy as we change the angle, right? So moving left to right, we're flattening this molecule out. And as we've said, the energy of this goes up a little bit because you're losing this H, H overlap. This one goes way down, so the energy is much better here because there's a lot more overlap than there is here. You're moving this up to create more overlap and this up to create more overlap. This approaches non-bonding because as soon as you move this up, it starts overlapping and destructing interference here and constructive interference here. So that at 180 approaches the same non-bonding character here. This is unaffected because no matter the angle, symmetry doesn't allow overlap. And so it's this trend with angle that is then used to predict molecular structure. Right? So if we consider all of these changing at the same time, right? What is the preferred angle when all four of these are filled? So if all four of these are exactly filled and two electrons per orbital would mean eight valence electrons here. That's the case for H2O. So H2O were over here. This is lower, which is good. This is lower. This is the same. Water would much, for, much more uh, prefer to be this type of bent structure. Why? Because these energies added together are lower than if it was linear adding together these energies. Right? So consider going from this bent structure, walking to the right and going to flat. This gets destabilized. This gets stabilized, but this gets equally destabilized. So the net effect from going from bent to linear is you're going up in energy. It wants to be lower energy, so water wants to be on this side of the diagram. Right? And the reason is because all of these are fully occupied. What if only the bottom one, or the bottom two, I should say, is occupied? What if I only have four valence electrons, like H2Be? One from each hydrogen and two from beryllium. Well, now only this and only this are occupied. So I'd much rather be 180 degrees because I get this huge, destabil huge stabilization and a very little cost of destabilization. These don't matter for beryllium because they're unoccupied. So I don't care about those. So it's just about these orbitals. And that is then explaining the linear structure of hydrogen to beryllium. Okay, so these diagrams are useful once we have some information about what the shapes of the molecular orbitals are and how changing the angle would change the energy. So that's really all I had for this short lecture, sort of applying molecular orbital theory to look at changes in structure. Next time, we're going to build this up from just three atoms to the bulk and look at band theory, semiconductors, and explain how atomic orbital overlap eventually creates bands and solids. That'll do it for this lecture. See you next time.